Welcome everyone. It's Angelo Robles to the Angelo Robles podcast. I'm also the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. Today we're going to cover transforming the family office and family enterprise, people, processes, and technology. I probably should have added in what may be the anchor of our discussion today, but I'm looping it into the technology part, and that is cybersecurity. I know a lot of the interviews that we've been doing lately have been more focused on investing, and I love that, and that's fun. Uh, but you have to have the anchor of governance, how decisions are made, and the importance, especially in an enterprise of people, processes, and technology, as I noted. And cybersecurity, for those of you that are active in investing, and especially in digital and crypto, where arguably there's additional risk, are something to be very, very familiar with. So let's take a little bit of a, a different approach today just to change things up a little bit. Our special guest, we're very honored, is Laura Maka, partner at Eisner Amper, one of the most prominent accounting uh, organizations in the world. And really, it's an honor to have Laura on. Laura, how are you? Very good. Thank you for having me, Angelo. Well, really excited about today's conversation. Let's be, let's start a little foundational, perhaps as I like to say, and you could segue into the impact of COVID. But effectively, mm -hmm. this comes down to, as the title says, the transforming of family offices and family enterprises off into remote. And then the whole thing about governance, how decisions are made, how do we lead? How do we quantify the successes now that we're remote? There's so many different factors and way more additional cybersecurity and other risks. So if you could talk a little bit about the black swan of COVID, the impact on our community uh, and what you're seeing and how things are evolving. Uh, I think COVID was like the, key spark that ignited this next phase of family office. Um, it's forced us to kind of rethink the way we work, um, the way we relate to one another, uh, and how do we think about the future. Um, and that goes from, like, like you mentioned, the governance. How are decisions being made? Um, how are we thinking about future generations? Um, and uh, protecting ourselves through not just uh, cybersecurity, but sustainability. Technology has been kind of an afterthought in the past and uh, it can't be anymore, right? It's, it's the key to sustainability. Um, so I think family offices are kind of looking at um, evolving into a more, uh, I, I wanna say institutionalized or formalized structure, right? Um, and putting some uh, structure around how those decisions are made. Um, making sure that the goals and risks are, um, you know, aligned with the family vision. Um, and again, uh, kind of thinking about future generations. But again, Let's, cybersecurity is at the forefront of almost every conversation I have with the family office now. Yeah, no, it certainly has moved to that forefront. Mm -hmm. I think you did say something, I'll elaborate a little bit, that I think it's important to lay a foundation on. It is, is important. It's going to sound like it's not to those that may not be as familiar. But the importance of uh, values, of vision, and of mission, kind of mm -hmm. the framework of governance to how decisions are made, what direction we're heading to, and a little bit of a formal process to follow. Uh, I believe in the world of the family office community and really in family businesses and generally even in personal families, don't you want to have some level of direction relative to those? How do you work with families in terms of their values, their vision, and their mission coming together to form a governance framework? Uh, it's most important to, um, number one, name the players, right? I think that's a, a conversation we're having more and more. Uh, previously, those decisions were made only by family members, right? And I think it's, uh, it's becoming more and more important to include an outside uh, advisor on that committee, right? They, they bring the experience of the family office um, and they help make those sometimes difficult decisions uh, that are hard to make, right? When it's only family. Uh, and it's really kind of going through the process of, uh, like you said, really 
really thinking about and, and um, documenting, right? Like what is their goal, right? What is their mission, right? And then tying it to every aspect of the family office, whether it's, you know, what investments do we make? What philanthropic um, endeavors do we pursue? Um, you know, how do we how do we operate? How do we um, kind of think about uh, you know the present present employees, right? What 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 skill sets do we need in order to be sustainable in the future? Uh, you know, looking at the future generation. You know, what how do we define our values uh, and teach them about the family office? Uh, about money, right, and about um, personal responsibility, right? So it's having those conversations and kind of formalizing it um, throughout the whole, and again, again, uh, having a roadmap, right, for everything, um, for and, sure. and, and putting some kind of um, framework on how decisions are made. I think that's the most important part is just having the framework, because those decisions will come up. Um, it's, it's, the, the plan has to be, it has to be flexible and adaptable because things change, right? It could be a family situation changes, uh, the dynamics, whether it's a marriage, uh, could be some kind of geopolitical, uh, environmental risk that needs to be addressed, right? And I think those are the things that people don't necessarily want to think about right now, right? And uh, they have to in order to be, have it to be sustainable. Yes. And Fortunately or unfortunately, maybe it adds some excitement to those in the family office world. The reality is things are governed and, and led by the family mm -hmm. and right. their goals could change. They could change mm -hmm. even frequently. So the ability to adapt, to have great emotional intelligence, to be able to listen and understand, and then have a process to the outcome to execute on those goals, even if they perhaps change and you have to scrap something, right. that's the life of the family office. I mean, it's not as institutional as many of us would probably like. Uh, and I think there's value bring, bringing institutional measures to a family office, but we can never forget that it does have that word family and family office. And that's kind of what makes it unique. In my master classes, I really pound home kind of my uh, three big things for, especially in today's world, a successful family office and probably sequentially people processes and some people could call that a system same thing and mm -hmm. technologies i could argue that technologies are moving up the rank but i would still put people number one but to mix things up a little bit let's start on that middle one uh processes mm -hmm. so now more than ever during covid uh where we're remote imagine one person that whatever did this uh and it may have been more operational and they go down because of COVID or they leave or get disabled, who knows? Mm -hmm. And now someone else doesn't know how to handle our process for wires. So having standard operating procedures, SOPs, having systems and processes, having services in the cloud, but safely secured, where if this goes wrong, here's who else could step up or here's what to do, or here's a framework of the process to follow. I'm assuming that's integral to the work that you do. How do you help families of wealth and family enterprises set up effectively powerful systems? Uh, the key again is to kind of, um, you know, the simplest lay, layman term is to do a process review, right? And look at the different components of the different offices, whether it's, um, you know, accounting or, you know, email or, you know, rules about working from home or, um, you know, bill paying, and then see how it's all integrated, right? And kind of, uh, you know, look at what can we automate, right? Developing that roadmap of, you know, are we operating efficiently, right? What there's, there's low hanging fruit, there's long, you know, there's long term goals. Um, but again, laying out that roadmap of, you know, where, where are people spending the most time? And because of COVID, what's not really so feasible, like one of the biggest, um, challenges uh, people have had is bill paying because a lot of people obviously you know, vendors send their bills through email or through mail right and which requires someone going into some office or some location and getting the mail and processing right um we don't think about it but that's kind of like the family office world um and they're looking to us saying you know what do we do now we really you know we have to force this person to come into the office or you know gather the mail um, and there's things that we can do, right? Um, whether it's, 
you know, we can talk about this a little bit later, but just kind of getting into the automation of a lot of vendors have turned into emailing their invoices, right? We can have uh, robotics and sim uh, simple bots, uh, you know, kind of go into your email, read the email, read the invoice, tag it to the vendor, tag it to a purchase order, and actually set up the payment, and book the entry into your um, general ledger, right? It can, it, it can be pretty extensive and actually shoot up the email or get, at least get it to the point of approval. Um, so it's really kind of looking at the processes, looking at your systems and uh, what makes sense based on uh, resources, you know, time and money, right? And prioritization. Um, but again, it's, it's really just kind of laying out the roadmap and, um, you know, what do you want to accomplish, right? There's the everyday, uh, you know, tasks. Uh, and we talk about, um, you know, we talk about technology, we talk about even with cybersecurity. And one of the biggest things is the process behind it. Um, I think we spoke at one point about, uh, I can't tell you the number of calls um, we've received over the last year of, you know, someone hacks into their um, system, right? And someone's watching the email. And then the founder or family member goes overseas or goes on vacation and uh, that's when they attack, right? That's when they, they penetrate and they'll send an email to whomever um, saying, hey, you know, there's a piece of artwork. I want to, I want to buy a transfer, send a wire transfer to this person, right? Um, and the person does it. Uh, it happened a month ago um, to someone I know and it was hundred thousand um, dollars in about three and a half minutes. Uh, and that's part of it is the technology piece of, you know, how do they penetrate, but it's also the process piece, right? What, what controls do you have? What approval process do you have before a wire transfer goes out, right? Um, and I think that's where, you know, people, um, you know, that's where the focus has been a lot lately is internal controls. That's probably our biggest request. Um, and just looking at um, the end-to-end -end process, right? How do we record it? How do we report it? Um, and you know, how do we do it efficiently with the lowest amount of risk? Yeah, actually, that was going to be my next follow up on standard operating procedures falling mm -hmm. under the auspice of, you know, processes and systems, which I believe now more than ever with more remote workers is incredibly important. And we'll get a little bit to the cloud and options mm -hmm. there and how valuable and incredibly important that in technologies are to really making the systems and remote work hum. But mm -hmm. you do bring up an important topic. I've covered it once before in detail, but having done hundreds of these, once isn't too much. Uh, and that would be internal controls. Uh, the importance of having checks and balances, of having probably outside auditing. And although it's an uncomfortable subject to bring up in our community, I mean, frauds do happen. And that's why it's important to have internal controls, to have proper measures in place, and to have external auditing to make sure to pick up there's no wrongdoings. Mm -hmm. uh, we could spend a whole two hours about internal controls, and you just hinted a little bit at it. But if you had to dive a little deeper and give a little bit more of the importance of internal controls for especially single family offices, I'd love to listen. Well, I think internal controls is very broad. Um, it can mean a lot of things. Uh, it's not just how decisions are made and, um, you know, do we have the, uh, the controls around it, but it's also um, anything from, uh, you know, where is the information stored? How is it backed up? Um, who has access to it? Um, and even things uh, like, is it, is it in the standard place? Uh, like a business continuity plan is another thing that we focus on a lot of, um, you know, how do we, if in, in case of a disaster, in case of an outage, in case of uh, any kind of uh, risk like that, um, how do we operate, right? Um, how do we, you know, continue to our, you know, in our day-to-day -day business um, without complete shutdown? Do we lose any, any kind of information? Um, so it really, it, it comes from everything from, um, you know, how do we document a, a, an entry, um, from, you know, from a bill to, you know, what kind of backup for information do we have? Um, now, you know, there's less and less paper, right? So, you know, people are, we're, you know, before we had file cabinets and we put something in a box and ship it to some off, you know, off storage site, right? Um, that's, it's becoming very obsolete at this point, right? And what do you do with that data? Um, and how is it secured? Uh, 
you know, even if you go to the cloud and you outsource or, in, you know, have internal people, it's, you know, what kind of controls do you have around it? Um, who can access the information? What kind of um, yearly uh, maintenance are you doing on it? Um, what kind of background checks on employees? You know, uh, what's the recruiting process like? Um, you know, what kind of um, ongoing, uh, uh, you know, social media, it, it go, even goes to social media and how the family uh, operates on the social media that impacts um, internal controls and who can access uh, what on home computers. I mean, it's just a broad range of, of, of topics. Um, and that's where I think uh, families are, are approaching us for help. Um, they kind of feel like, you know, I think uh, the last stat I, uh, I saw was in 2019, 25% of family offices were hit with some kind of um, attack, right? Um, yeah. And it's really tied to how do they operate? Like, what's their processes? What are their process like? How do we protect them? Um, uh, you know, it's emails, uh, you know, decisions, how decisions are made, um, documented um, rules around, you uh, anything from, you know, what can you send out from your work, you know, work email, it, all that is encompassed in it, right? So it's really, families are really struggling with, um, you know, how do we, how do we um, approach that? Um, and it's really just, it's, it's a beginning to end process. It's end to end process review and, 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 and looking at all the different components of how the family office uh, operates. Oh, for sure. And again, it's, all these are topics. So if we silo them, we could go on for hours. They're great. If I had to touch on people, which probably mm -hmm. are the most important thing in a family mm -hmm. enterprise, a family office, a family foundation, pretty much any business. And again, a subject that probably is my favorite relative to leadership, mm -hmm. to engagement, to hiring the right people, to motivating them. Mm -hmm. But if I had to pick a couple of things that stand out in my mind to keep it relatively succinct, uh, and many of us fall into this, probably yourself and me, it's important to be very aware of ego and blind spots. Mm -hmm. A lot of what you learned, which may have been accurate, no longer works. I was gonna use a rougher word, I'm trying to be politically correct on, on YouTube and other platforms. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to have an open mind. We spoke offline, let's bring mm -hmm. it a little online, that I can't tell you how many times I've had people hired into a family office that are like, yeah, this is uh, effectively what they're telling me, like the last stage of my career. And I'm just going to, I'm kind of in a semi-retirement. Maybe I'll do this for three or five years. They're almost making it sound like because they're, they, they had a good career and they're trustworthy. And that's very, very important mm -hmm. in the family office. I'm not discounting that, but it's kind of like they're almost coasting just to not to mess things up. I don't know about you, but I like a little more rigor, a little more institutional approach, a little bit more of a go-getter uh, in the approach of really being on top of the ball and being very aware of ego and blind spots, which is why an outside person like yourself uh, doing something like a tabletop exercise, mm -hmm. putting them through like a red cell scenario, mm -hmm. uh, here's an emergency faked, here's what could go wrong, how was the response? And let's not yell and scream. Let's what you did good, what you didn't do so good, and what could be improved in terms of decision making and systems. I'm throwing a lot at you for something I wanted just to keep a couple of minutes. But what would you say about that? No, I agree. I think, um, like you said, trust is such a huge factor in values, right, to the family office. So when they do look to certain positions, it could be someone they've known, it could be an advisor they've worked with before, or it could be someone that they feel is very uh, qualified as far as experience, right? And uh, just CFO, right? Like, oh, they're great CFO. They'd be a great CFO and they come in um, and it's business as usual, right? And I think it's really important to think about uh, the skill sets um, and the experience that are needed in order to bring the family office um, into the future and be sustainable, right? It's a change of mindset, like you said. Um, definitely egos out the door, being open, uh, open to feedback, open to um, a new way of uh, operating. Uh, so it's not, and when something goes wrong, it's not like, okay, I won't say the word, but it didn't go so well, right? Let's just fix it and move on, right? It's it's really um, diagnosing and, and, and getting down to like what caused it, right? And how do we do better? Um, and how do we prevent this from happening uh, in the future? 
Um, and I think that's where um, that leadership skill and the, and the foresight um, to think about the future is really important. Um, and again, we do a lot of that, um, you know, talking to, talking to potential candidates um, and uh, proposing different scenarios and how they would handle it, or you know, what do they see as um, the top priorities for for a family office and what their approach is, right? Um, it's really just reimagining uh, the way we all been working for years, right? And oh, sure. really getting a different getting a different skill set. Um, and and you know, we always say visionary and innovative are you know those those key terms that. Um, are being thrown out, but it really is important to think about, you know, how do we operate differently within um, within a structured environment, right? You don't really want to go rogue and kind of go crazy with those decisions either, but being able to develop a framework to make those decisions and then think, uh, think about uh, things differently, right? For sure. And then you have the other aspect that involves the word family and family office and people that I just said. Mm. That's the assuming there is one, usually there is, but a rising generation, younger mm. people in the family office that are starting to be active and wanting to be more active in it, to learn more, uh, to potentially be on boards and committees and possibly be influential uh, in terms of possibly even decision making. And then that couples in with succession. Most mm -hmm. family offices do not make it past usually an older creator that creates the family office. Mm -hmm. uh, the younger generation doesn't feel engaged. They look at it as a cost. They don't look at it as being optimized relative to them. And sadly, I think they're kind of often correct. Mm -hmm. uh, but as opposed to just scrapping the SFO, I think there could be better uh, communication processes and systems in place, engaging them to have it ramp up to be more of what the next generation is going to want in the family office. If you could talk a little bit about the engagement of the rising generation and that impact on succession planning in the family office. Um, definitely agree. I think most family offices, it's very rare um, at this point to see family offices even thinking about something beyond the first generation, let alone the second and third generation coming up, right? Um, so they're all really focused on, um, like you said, how do we engage them, right? Because sometimes the family office is someplace that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's generating the wealth or it's managing the investments. But other than that, it's, it's you know, there is no engagement, right? So a lot of, um, a lot of the larger family offices <clears throat> are either hiring an educational officer or, you know, outsourcing that role. To, to step back and say, how do we engage this next generation? How do we educate them um, and you know, instill that, those, ability, those skill sets, right? That if they do want to take over and have a, 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 a integral part in the family office operations, that they have the skill set, right? The last thing you want is you know, someone passes away or founder passes away or ready to retire and it's oh, next in line is the son or daughter um, and they, don't, they haven't been, um, educated on that, right? So giving them, um, you know, during specialized, um, during family meetings, making it an educational um, endeavor, meeting with them regularly, mm -hmm. getting them involved in the family office, educating them how, you know, what the importance is and all these things we're talking about, making sure that they're aware of all these, uh, whether it's you know, governance and, and cybersecurity and operations. Um, so they're aware of it and, and ready um, to operate um, in that manner. And then, Again, it's just giving, providing that skill set. Uh, a lot of them are, are, are sending people to leadership programs, right? Um, anything to get that, get that experience and get that, uh, uh, you know, skill set. And I think a lot of family offices are, are sitting back and saying, what do we need? Which is, I think is the most important um, um, aspect of this is it's not like who's next in line or who, you know, has a desire. It's who really, like we talked about, has that mindset, right? Is is prepared to to operate in that manner, um, and I think that sometimes may lead to difficult decisions or conversations. Um, but it's the key to sustainability, um, and really looking at what skill sets do they need, um, even when they're internally how they're operating. Like it really thinking about, um, you know, who has. Uh, 
who's more of a, a structure person, who's more of um, a process person, who's more of the investment side and, and looking at um, what everyone brings to the table um, and what they need, right? And um, even internally having a, a plan for each, uh, each uh, you know, component of the family office or, or division of the family office, um, whether it's you know, trust, whether it's legal, well, it's philanthropic and having a plan and actually attributing what skill set is needed um, for those roles and then really documenting you know, who would be the next in line, whether it, it could be family, it could be not family, right? I think that's the, the decision that a lot of uh, family offices are making now. For sure. And it's hard for me to imagine people not being number one and system processes not mm -hmm. being number two. But no question, the third one that we're going to probably mainly focus on is fast rising. Uh, and that is technology. And I'm being very broad in terms mm -hmm. of with that term. We discussed that a lot of the technologies have gotten so good, they're so intuitive that what I'm hearing feedback from people in the family office world are, oh, this kind of remote has worked a little better than I thought. And some of the technologies that we had to implement, especially on communication and project management, they're easier to use than I thought. But it did take the impetus of something mm -hmm. terrible, COVID-19, to happen to force people to get out of their comfort zone and to adapt pretty much out of necessity. Uh, so we'll get into some specific technology systems and mm. cyber in a second, right. but if you could talk more broadly, I don't know if it's the governance around technology, evaluating where we are, how it could be enhanced, because it could make us possibly have better communication, uh, project management, uh, better look through in detail on our investment portfolio and make better decisions. So it actually has an impact, not just in speeding things up, but on the bottom line. Uh, how do you initially start that conversation looking to enhance per the goals of the family and the family office, the technology? Well, I think like, like you said, the, the pandemic really has forced um, that conversation um, in lots of ways. Um, like some of them, a lot of family offices may have struggled, but a lot have said, hey, this isn't so bad. And it's actually really good, right? <laughs> it's, it's, we're getting, we're getting better, better answers. But a lot of the technology um, conversations have to do with uh, collaboration, integration, uh, security, and then there's obviously, like we talked about, the process improvements, right? Um, and a lot of those conversations are really driven um, by the family office now um, and uh, these future generations. Um, they want they want some collaborative tool. They want to be able to look through and um, see the different investments and the tiering and make those uh, make data driven solutions um, quickly, right? And um, as they formalize something, they need some kind of project management, right? And what what do we do? Like, what software is out there? How you know? How do we even get started? Do we need to hire a project manager? Um, so again, we we kind of look at where they are. Um, and talk, again, align to the goals of the family office and um, develop a plan. And a lot of it is just um, different. It's a, it's, a, it's a roadmap into different solutions. We talk about first, you know, how do we, how do we get you to a place that is standardized? Because um, that's the key to a lot of the automation. Then For how sure. do you want, you know, how do you, you can't automate what's not standardized, right? I think that's the biggest struggle people have. Um, is can I automate this? I'm like, you can, but you know, if you have things stored here and another one stores it in here, and then um, you know, this system is just independent um, of one another, it's hard to have that integration and um, collaboration. So it's really talking about what the, it's really kind of showing uh, what's possible, right? And in the most simplest terms, like what do you want to accomplish? And this is what you can accomplish. And they really get a, a lot of family, they get excited about it because that's what they have to do. Um, you know, they're get, the future generation is a mobile a mobile generation, right? They wanna be able to get on their phone and see things, right? Um, and we are able to do that now. They wanna be able to make a decision and know alternative uh, investments uh, and do different scenarios very quickly. Um, they wanna know what they own um, and you know what happens if, uh, you know, 
I, I start doing business here or I decide to retire um, in Florida or you know Puerto Rico or somewhere else. Um, so it's really that um, instant re, uh, real time, how do we collaborate? Um, how do we get transparency, accountability? Those are all things that the family office wants now. And I think it's just sitting down with them and coming up with a plan. Um, yeah. yeah, those were some great words on uh, accountability and real time. And as the younger generation rises, and again, they're so fluid in technology and wanting things quicker and quicker, they're usually incredibly well-educated. I mean, I could say some negative things too, but I'll be mm -hmm. positive. But those are all gonna be tremendous advantages of them rising into positions of authority. And people from the Generation Z and the younger millennials, one, they're huge generations, so they're gonna have tremendous political clout they're mm -hmm. gonna be the politicians, they're gonna be the business leaders, and they're not really gonna to adapt to you baby boomers, I'm sorry. You're probably gonna to need to more adapt to them. That's just the reality of it. Uh, they, I mean, I don't know if I, I'm trying to be a little funny. <laughs> if I know any 21 year old that uses email, how they communicate mm -hmm. is very different. And again, that's meant to be a little tongue in cheek, don't take it too literal. It just means their form of communication is incredibly different and there will need to be an adaption, probably both sides, but probably more so as they come into more of a position of authority, us. Uh, relative to technology, so I could break it down. I would probably start with communication. And I don't know if that has changed that much. You have things like Zoom, where we're mm -hmm. on now, uh, you potentially have Slack, you have other platforms that again, out of necessity, they had to learn. It's relatively simple and straightforward. Project management's a little more complex, but you have some things that are even near free, like Trello, and there's many other programs. If you could talk a little bit uh, about the one-two punch of the importance of communication and project management, especially during COVID and more remote. And if you wanna talk about some specific platforms, like for one, I find Trusted Family to be a very intriguing platform for collaboration, communication globally. Feel free to chime in. Um, definitely, I think, um... You know, like you said, COVID, I think we've all become accustomed. It's like the Zoom is the four letter word we're all saying now. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, it, you know, whether it's Microsoft Teams as people um, move or migrate to, to 365, Microsoft 365, yeah, a lot of, a lot of the Teams is very good. Um, and it's really, uh, I, there's, there's something to be said because it's really easy to jump on uh, a Zoom call, right? Where Previously, you'd want to set up a, a, a you know in-person meeting or come into the office or let's meet or get a let's get a conference room and talk about this, and now it's really easy, um, you know, to jump on a Zoom call and and share, uh, you know, share screens. And I think people are in, are really um, seeing the value of that, um, which kind of leads to the importance of having these solutions and tools available, right? From, you know, when you share a screen, it means that something is automated and it's on your computer as opposed to a piece of paper, right? So that's the first step is making sure that um, that's available. But, um, you know, as the as they approach, um, you know, these initiatives, um, and it, it's not just technology initiatives, it's, um, it could be, uh, you know, some offices have moved to a management operating model, right? And they're right. Um, it could be they're looking into some philanthropic initiative. It could be, um, you know, having a trust reviewed on an annual basis, right? Um, those are all processes that need to be managed and making sure that they get to the goal in a good way. Um, so it's really important to have uh, a project management approach to things. Um, because it really, when you follow that model, um, you're really establishing that goal. Um, you're establishing how to get there. You're thinking about potential problems and how do you mitigate the risk to, you know, uh, avoid those problems or deal with those problems when they're coming up. Um, and it gives, it, it makes you think about things of, you know, how, how things should happen, right? And what's the follow-up behind it? Like maybe we implemented something and you can't just drop a ball, right? Like just because we did, we, there's a follow-up. There's a, there's an ongoing maintenance to everything, right? And how do we, how do we make sure that we're keeping on top of all this, right? So, project management I think is key in everything. It's it's key in what I do. Um, 
but it's, I think people are learning that it's not just about a specific project, but, you know, how do we operate and how, you know, what things happen on a regular basis. And, and it's not just a one-time thing. Um, and the tools have varied, like you said, um, I could name 10 tools um, that are um, great. I think it's more important to kind of look at the office and what their specific needs are. And it, sometimes it depends on the number of people in the, in the office and the staff. Um, do you want to include outside advisors in that, in that um, project management uh, workflow and have them have access to it? Um, you know, I tend to, you know, the, the, it normally doesn't make any sense to kind of have a homegrown um, solution. It's, it's too expensive to maintain, um, but there are a lot out there. Um, and surprisingly, as people are moving to 365, a lot of people are using the Microsoft Project uh, Manager as one of their tools because um, it's becoming integrated with everything Absolutely. else, right? No, it's um, right, so I think that's, that's more important. Um, I know that uh, you know, a lot of the project management tools, you wanna be able to have some kind of dashboard um, in order sure. to track things, right? So no one wants to look at the day-to-day -day and, the, and, the, and the details and no one wants to look at an email with a summary either. Um, they want it like we wanna have access to it all the time. Like where are we with the, these things and how are they going? Um, so when you have a, a good system, um, it's able to speak to other systems and you, know, you can develop these dashboards that give you that real-time data. Um, you know, we label things and we'll have, you know, at-risk projects and you know, um, on track um, and, you know, what the roadmap is and the milestones and who's responsible for it. So, you know, you know exactly. right. So I think the that's that they're making, especially remotely when you may not have that face to face, you need something like this. I mean, I think it's in, that it's incredibly valuable, uh, especially in the service centric family office where it mm -hmm. services what could be multiple daily requests from the family. Mm -hmm. If you're the leader, what's your systems for that? What's the project management? Who is it assigned to? Are they updating the progress on it? And I know that sounds like a lot of steps. And again, every family office is going to be different. But if you want to have more quantifiable measures, which probably does need to improve in most single family offices, uh, you do need to do it this way. I mean, this is the way it should be done. Yeah, and it's either even policies, like even when if you get to a, a tax, um, a tax policy, right? And you might you might create one, um, but it might change. Something might change, right? And what what mechanism or what um, what do you have in place to make sure that you're looking into this and it hasn't changed from year to year and it's still relevant, right? Like how many of us have picked up a, a policy and it's dated like 1998 and that's after someone searched for it for a while and. Yeah, this is the last policy we have on depreciation or, or meals or you know expense reporting, right? Um, so it's really having something in place that um, it sounds very, like you said, very like task and, and um, uh, task oriented, but it's it's really the key of of operating seamlessly and um, you know reducing that risk and thinking about the future. For sure. I mean, a common question that comes up with me on technology and how has it changed during COVID for you is aggregation and reporting on the investment mm -hmm. assets of the family and how the mm -hmm. younger generation likes to have real time. And some of them may not want incredibly granular detail, mm -hmm. more high level or vice right. versa. Sometimes that works both ways. Some of the arguments I heard in the past were it's too expensive. I don't quite see the value relative to the cost. And sometimes it's a lack of confidence in the internal capability to be mm -hmm. able to best leverage and use that technology. Uh, but they're definitely for more active investing family offices that have diverse portfolios. It also could act as a great x-ray into the portfolio to see through, to make better investment decisions, tax lot accounting decisions. I believe it's important, but if you put in you know, the Ferrari of systems and you know how to use 10% of its capabilities, then you are wasting money. Well, that's, I mean, that's an important point because a, a lot of uh, family offices that I've spoken to in the past, uh, are, they're now looking at uh, enterprise uh, ERP systems, right? And mm -hmm. revamping their um, general ledger. I think, I think I looked at it a few years ago and 92% of the family offices were using QuickBooks. Um, yeah. Right, um, and there's nothing wrong with QuickBooks, and it might be the right answer for a lot of the family offices, but it's not for, um, especially the, as they get more complex and they're getting bigger, um, and doing that reporting. And 
uh, you know, I've seen family offices spend, you know, so much time gathering information for like quarterly family meetings, right? Like let's get the financial statements, you know, consolidated and um, giving that per family member view. And it's like, it's like an exercise of a fortune 500 company just to get that data together for a family meeting. Um, and, you know, I think the, you know, the controllers and the CFOs are struggling with that. Um, and it's always, uh, it's, it's a challenge, right? And they need to get to slice and dice that information and have that real time access um, to be able to click on a family member and get basically an org chart. Cause even the simple, the most simplest um, of family offices they tend to create a lot of, of entities, right? Like it's a very specific owner, you know, they buy something, a buy a building and they set up an LLC, right? Like it's very, so next thing you know, you have like 90 or a hundred LLCs, right? With different family members or even more. Um, and just to be able to gather that insight of what's going on, it's just a, it's a, it's a manual um, time consuming task. And um you know, there's, there's, you know, and this future generation doesn't want to wait. They don't want to wait to the family meeting. They don't want to wait until you gather together. I want to be able to log in and go to this platform and, um, uh, you know, look at what, you know, look, 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 look what I have and be able to make those decisions. Um, I think someone uh, asked a question about. Yeah, I was going to actually bring that up in yeah. my next comment. And like you said, I agree. QuickBooks is better than nothing, mm -hmm. depending on the size of the family office and their capability. Uh, and you mentioned before bill pay. So like bill.com and platforms like right. that. But for families with sophisticated multi-entities, although it could be a little bit of a complex program. So again, know how to use it, but like, have you used Sage Intact or one of those programs that are more sophisticated than say a QuickBooks? We did, we actually, uh, Intact is one of the softwares that we implemented at yeah. the family office that I was uh, with. Um, and again, um, the point I was gonna make earlier was the most important thing is not to jump to, you know, what is the best software? What does it do, right? It's really like, what do I need and what's my plan? Um, and how is it, how are we gonna pull different things together? Because the worst case scenario, which it happens it happens so often is they they spend the time and the resources for a new system and they you know they buy it they do that initial um, <laughs> implementation and yeah. they're like oh what do you mean it doesn't do this right and then it becomes right. costly because either you have to do customization or you have to do um, canned um, add-ons which you know is is typical right there's a lot of canned uh, add-ons that you can um, to use whether it's an HR function or something else or like bill pay um, it's okay, but it's it's important to have that mapped out in the beginning, right? So, I think the 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 most important part of the process, which is probably the most painful for family offices, is the gathering what I call business requirements, right? Of what do we really need in detail? Everything from like I want to be able to consolidate, you know, this and this, right? Or I want to be able to you know send out a payment using this, um, and really um detailing those and then when you're interviewing these different vendors have them show you your, your top you know top business requirements like what's a must-have and how do you accomplish that not the demo right like a lot of the vendors come out and give you a demo but really you know you narrow it down um based on your business requirements and have them come out and actually show you give the give you a mock-up of what it looks like um what you're looking for right and see if it works for you um so it's, there's a lot of um the the thinking and the business requirement i would say is the hardest part and the most time consuming part right and then um uh finding a solution that's best for you i think you know you can go for something that's really sophisticated or um there's a lot of independent um you know uh, platforms out there that cater specifically to family offices, but it, it could be large systems like Intact or Adapar. Um, there are, um, you know, smaller um, uh, firms that have their own software, includes like Meridor has their own platform. Mm -hmm. um, so there's really, it's, it's really looking at, um, yeah, there's, I can give you a top 10 list, but it doesn't, it doesn't say a lot until you know what your requirements are, right? And what your family office is, they, they range. Um. For sure, for sure. Let's uh, segue over into perhaps the last, but very important subject and ties into technology and really the other things we spoke about as well. And that's really 
perhaps the biggest threat for many, and that is cybersecurity, mm -hmm. now more than ever. Uh, a definite threat to the family is they have a bullseye on their back because mm -hmm. they could be low hanging fruit. And a lot of them don't have the protocols and security measures that say larger corporations and institutions do. And mm -hmm. I'll argue for the family office executive, not a great look for you if there's yeah. bad things happening from the cybersecurity aspect. It's hard to get in this community and it's something that perhaps could even get you fired. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is something that you need to be familiar with and need to take very seriously. Uh, how do you go about the initial foundation of understanding the family and the family office's cybersecurity protocols and education? Do you do a manual? Do you have a policy and procedures? Where do you begin? Um, well, first, it's really looking at how they operate. What do, what do they have in place? Um, you know, and who, and it's also staffing, right? Um, what kind of IT resources do they have in-house and what are they using, if anything, um, you know, outside? Um, and then really defining um, what do they need, right? Like, I think more and more people are hiring, um, you know, the CTOs and the CIOs um, uh, positions, but um, really looking at whether they, it makes sense to outsource um, certain functions, right? And then you need a policy uh, and procedure manual for anyone. Uh, I think security has to be embedded in the culture um, and, you know, employees need to be trained and reminded and to be thinking about it constantly. Um, so really having uh, educational uh, requirements, whether it's, um, you know, an annual, it could be something uh, recorded that they log in and, you know, they at least go through the, the, the video and answer questions. But I think we spoke earlier, I think most, I sit on a, an IRS advisory committee um, and I want to say, I think the number was like 40% of um, uh, fraud originates from employee uh, behavior, right? Which really means phishing scams um, and, uh, and then also security patches, right? So uh, having a policy in place with, um, you know, who, educating them on, on uh, what a phishing scam looks like and what do they do if they get one. Um, if they're working from home, right? And educating them on, on Wi-Fi and having rules around um, the Wi-Fi um, and, uh, uh, you know, with or at a Starbucks, right? And they log in to be aware of simple things like that are, are, are generating sure. um, the majority of the, of the scams. Um, security patches is the other one that you wouldn't think of, but if you don't do it timely, uh -huh. you know, people are looking for those holes constantly, right? Like um, constantly looking for those, those, those holes in the security. Um, and it's really, um, it, no matter what, which direction you go, it's just more having um, a protocol in place. Um, we talked about, uh, you know, even the most sophisticated uh, firms are going to outsource certain things like um, we said penetration testing um, and things like um, purposely trying, they're basically purposely trying to hack your system to see where the holes are, right? That's a 24 seven um, responsibility, right? So cybersecurity isn't something that we put in place and we say, okay, we hired this company, we have some antivirus, we set up some firewalls, we have two-factor authentication, we're all set, right? Like, and let's move on until next year, we can look at it. It's really making sure that you're covered 24 seven because those the the level of complexity uh, of fraud occurring is, is growing and growing, right? And, um, it's very hard to be prepared with someone internally with that with having unless they're connected with someone externally to give them that education or having that experience. So it's you know setting up policies and procedures, having the protocols in place, having the testing done uh, in place. Um, those are all those are all key factors. Um, that's why an internal control review is really critical. One of the most critical steps you can take in the beginning. Um, it's yeah, really protecting, right. and it's not just about money, right? It's about reputational damage. Huh, um, of course. Right. And, you know, that's, it's the second biggest, um, you know, concern from families, right. Um, and privacy. So, you know, having, you know, having rules of, you know, what you, um, you know, what you post, right. Even family members, like sometimes, you know, founder or, or son or has a grandson, oh, here, and they post pictures of where they are, right. Something simple like that. Um, and now the whole world knows that the family is, you know, somewhere in Mexico. 
um, vacationing. Um, so really, uh, really simple things to most the most sophisticated things, but making sure that it's it's um, there's a procedure and it's communicated and there's um, ongoing, um, you know, testing of it is, is incredible to it. Yeah, I mean, there's some really sharp and sophisticated bad guys and girls out there. And it's not just Wi-Fi, it's radio frequency and magnetic. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, if you're identified and they really, really want you and get into something, it's sometimes hard to get out of that web unless you have really good measures in place, really really good measures. And even then, looking at it from a third party perspective, there probably is one weaker link inside the family office somewhere. Mm -hmm. That person uh, with what we call white knight hacking, mm -hmm. you know, they should get a warning about, you know, you need to really follow our procedure. We did this. But if that if that starts to be a pattern, maybe even the second time, for sure, the third time, then I, I think that person needs to go. I mean, I hate to sound a little harsh here, but that's how serious this is. Uh, families of wealth, people know who they are. Uh, and by the way, are you all familiar that on Google, like reverse image search, I could take a picture of you that you perhaps never even published before, but through facial recognition of their mm. AI, I could probably find out who you are through the background. I may be able to GPS it. Maybe not me personally, but someone who's a lot better than me on technology and these issues. It's that's all the risk of social media, of posting pictures and all that, and needing to be aware of the consequences if you're from that kind of family. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get off track, but I'll mention another little scary point for people uh, who are active in crypto, which I completely understand. I'm incredibly active in it. And maybe don't use institutional level custodians. They keep it on a hardware wallet. That's moderately secure. I would really look for an air gap and I don't want to get into detail. I could do three hours about that subject. I honestly saved that for my consulting clients. Uh, but these companies are getting hacked. The companies are getting hacked left and right, left and right. Now, what the bad guys get from that is, oh, so this person has a wallet and they may be able to triangulate if you got a decent amount of quote unquote change in there. Mm -hmm. These are bearer assets. Uh, there's been home invasions. Hasn't really happened here in the US. Has happened more in Europe and other countries. I would be really, really careful, uh, which is why on that aspect, I would skew for larger purchases to over the counter and institutional level custody. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I don't want to get off track, but what I am saying is the bad guys are really smart. They could figure out a lot of stuff. And a lot of these companies that you think are secure, including some of the companies that we mentioned for other purposes, they get hacked left and right. Uh, so we're making fun of family offices, but a lot of the companies are getting hacked. Uh, but that's what, but that's what the important thing is, is actually, you know, people are thinking, you know, here's this software, here's this platform. Let me go, <laughs> you know, I have some crypto, right. And yeah. here's my wallet. And they're not thinking about the company they're actually using, right? And you know, as a you know, as with Eisner Amper, obviously, we, when you know, when we engage or, or bring on a, a third party, there's a whole host of um, you know security protocols that we have to make sure that they follow, right? Sure. Um, and are they SOC compliant? That's one of the biggest things that um, we look at crypto. And if they're not, we we can't continue. We can't engage them, right? Because they don't they don't have the protocols in place. Um, so I think people just need to kind of step back and and it's it could be quick, it could be easy. Everyone's using it, um, and you know one transaction could lead into something else. And people are not even thinking about how it's connected. Maybe they're connecting it with on using their phone, right? And the system gets hacked, and it's it's somehow they can hack. You know they can hack into your your own um, uh, systems using that, right? And now the whole family's infected, right? Or possibly at risk. It's really like a, a domino effect of of making sure that you're thinking about, you know, what you're what you're engaging and what kind of information you're putting in there. Who has that information? Because um, it really could be catastrophic to the. Yeah, that also family. does bring up another question, probably more so for larger scale mm -hmm. family offices that do have someone who's like a CTO, a chief mm -hmm. technology officer in charge of cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. I, I, I hate to make it more complicated and more internal controls than it needs to be, mm -hmm. but you don't want to have one person have the complete keys to the kingdom. Right. Uh, how do you deal with that issue? 
again, it's that it's that internal control and having that uh, right. protocol and checks and balances, right? It's just it's so key, right? Like we, and it's you know we all kind of tend to think about it. We all have our own responsibilities, and um, you know uh, he's handling it, she's handling it, um, and you think it's it's going well, but it's um, making sure that everything is covered, right? There's always a, a check and balance, just out of experience and asking those questions. And then sometimes you just, it's part of being careful of like who you hire too, especially in the beginning, right? And making sure that um, it's not just skill set, but there's uh, background checks too and everyone you hire um, and then ongoing, just making sure that decisions are made and, and uh, uh, fully vetted, researched and um, probed, right? To make sure that um, you're getting to the right point. So. Um, no matter what, I don't think any decisions should be made by one person. It's, you're always getting input from lots of people. That's what uh, I think smart people do is get that input. And then, you know, some, someone ultimately makes that decision, but there's a, a check in there that someone can uh, to look at. And a little bit of a subject I covered at prior roundtables in the tech capital of the U.S. at Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I haven't done one in a year or two when there were varying opinions. And that was, do I keep as a family office try to be hyper private in my own internal servers or do mm -hmm. I trust the cloud? And I would mm -hmm. say the pros back two or three years ago were about 50-50 and they each made good points. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that most families are not gonna have airtight internal servers that they're on top of, that they're updating. Yeah, there's some hyper security, uh, hyper secure families that do offshore servers that have it in, uh, jurisdictions with very powerful IP protections mm -hmm. of Scandinavian countries and Switzerland. That's a complete different level. But for most families, cloud has gotten much better, including the security. If you could talk a little bit, and it allows the remote work and the collaboration and the systems and processes to flow much, much more smoother. How would you compare the two now? Because it has changed in the last couple of years. Yeah, I think... I think not just family offices, but I think firms um, across industries uh, in the past haven't been um, comfortable with the cloud. Um, and now, I mean, overwhelmingly, um, I can say that it's, you know, the, the cloud is safer than anything that's home, you know, homegrown and on its own platform. Um, I think it's, like you said, there are, there are uh, firms that are uh, more advanced, um, and farther along and have robust systems, but that's, that's I think the rarity as opposed to the norm in the family oh, office world. So. <laughs> um, so definitely the cloud is um, where people are uh, gravitating to, um, definitely more safe and allows for uh, the type of integration that everyone wants, right? It has that functionality, it has that capability. It's easier to integrate different, um, different um, systems uh, when it's cloud-based. So definitely, um, I think, people are, are, are finally to the point of the realizing that's, that's the way to go. And again, it goes back to our earlier point is just making sure that, you know, you're looking at the reputational um, reputation of those, of those companies that you choose and making sure you're doing your due diligence when you're choosing them um, is more important. I mean, this is a real complex subject. Again, there's so much to it from encryption, basic coding, pen testing, patch management. I mean, we could get really, really deep on the, on the cyber security mm -hmm. issues. And it probably is about up there, like I said, and Laura agreed with like the number one concern and should be mm -hmm. of many, many family offices. So this is definitely something, if nothing else, maybe a little bit of a wake up call mm -hmm. and to take action on it, especially now with more and more people working remotely and more of a chance for just things to go wrong because it's not as centralized, if I could use that word. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I mean, I think this is really, really important stuff and having, you know, an outside entity to come look at the weaknesses, understand the goals and really work together collaboratively, uh, remotely or in person with the team mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, the bad guys may want to go for the lowest hanging fruit. Don't be the lowest hanging fruit, even mm -hmm. if you're not perfect, if you're progressing in your progress on cybersecurity, that's probably going to make you more secure, quote unquote, than most. Definitely, I agree. Um, I think uh, I think people are, you know, I think like we said, people are looking at um, their enterprise system. They're looking at 
more cloud-based solutions. Um, so it's really, I think they're getting a little bit overwhelmed um, with the process, but it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be so overwhelming. I think um, just to kind of put it all together is if you have the, that governance, right, to make those decisions and you have those, you know, risks outlined and you, you know, approach it as a, um, with a project management um, approach um, and you're, you have your goals and your, your future vision set, then it all kind of comes into, um, uh, you know, into a good place with a plan, right? It's all, it's all connected, um, how we make those decisions, the framework, the decisions, the controls around it. And then, then finally, like you said, the technology. So it's really, it, it really is people process technology, right? Um, so so people, people jump to the technology and it's really, they're skipping the whole people process um, piece of it. Um, that's a problem. They're really, you know, it's just like the question. Well, it's like the question we, we, you know, someone posed in the chat is like, what software, you know, is what's a good, good alternative to QuickBooks? Um, and you know, we can name a lot of things. We can name like we talked about Adapar, Archway, um, Intat, Canoe. You know, there's there's so many other um, software. It's really just looking at the needs of the family office um, and um, setting that roadmap. For sure, for sure. Someone sent in a text a little too deep of a cyber question, but uh, yes, I do know what they are. Faraday cages, which are very protective of all forms of quote unquote intrusion. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some families I know that are very concerned about things that do use things like that for a variety mm -hmm. of different perspectives, mm -hmm. EMI shielding, etc. But we're probably getting a little too deep into the weeds of something very niche -y. Uh, you know, and maybe on that note, Laura, in wrapping up, talk a little bit about you and your organization and the work that you do with families, including uh, many, if not all of the things that we discussed today. Um, sure. Uh, my role is business transformation. So I'm looking at people process technology for the firm. Um, and again, the firm itself provides an array of services, okay, uh, auditing, tax work, advisory, consulting, um, and uh, a large, very experienced family office group um, with also, uh, we have a division um, that focuses on uh, broadly technology, right? And helping those you know, family offices address everything that we talked about, whether it's um, with, in conjunction with our family office is uh, providing that roadmap and helping with uh, a succession plan or setting up a government stru uh, governance structure um, looking at cybersecurity during doing internal controls, um, helping uh, family offices make those decisions, prioritize what should be done, when when it should be done, um, helping them with some quick, you know, RPA solutions, maybe, um, and also helping them choose this enterprise um, system, right? So sometimes we can do the work. Sometimes we're advising, right? Giving that structure in place, um, helping helping vet um, these ERP. Uh, firms and managing that process. So we do that initial project management of, of the whole process. Um, so everything we talked about, again, um, educating family members, setting up government structures, uh, governance structures, doing the tax work, doing the back office um, work, doing the accounting function, bookkeeping, um, uh, really becoming a, a kind of a strategic partner um, with, the, with the family offices um, as they become less, um, uh, I would say like fi historical financial reporting, right? It's always been about how do we gather the information so that we can summarize it and give it to the family office and do our tax returns and do um, whatever close. And it's really um, more thinking about um, uh, providing, uh, being a strategic partner and how do you make those decisions in the future uh, is really where uh, family offices are, are focusing their, their resources on now. And Laura, for those that would like to reach out and learn more, whether it's a company website, your email, your contact info, how mm -hmm. could they do so? Um, I'm not sure if there was an invite on this, but it's eiseramper.com. Um, I think I'm on there on the uh, professional di directory or it's uh, laura.maca at eiseramper.com. Uh, Feel free and whoever asked that question about, I think it's Jeffrey asked the question about the alternatives. I'd be happy to speak to anyone um, and have a chat with them about um, different softwares that uh, we're familiar with and um, it kind of give you whatever experience I have with them. 
Yes, I highly recommend Iser Ampner and Laura certainly have a chance to reach out, learn more. They'll be a great resource for you. Uh, are you also active on LinkedIn? And people could also reach I am. out to me. Yes, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, yep, I am on Let's LinkedIn. Lock up post. CCA, correct? Yep, yes. Okay. Um, and we also have links for Iser Ampner. We, we put on a lot of webcasts um, for family offices to talk about all these things in more in depth. Um, we actually have a series coming up where we'll focus on these you know, different components, but more in depth. So if someone wants to talk about cybersecurity, you know, we can go into a lot of detail on that. Um, and it'll be more focused to the, you know, the audience's, uh, uh, you know, needs. For sure. Everyone in concluding, I'm Angelo Robles, the host of the Angelo Robles podcast and the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. A good, a little bit of a different subject that we covered today and was really great to have Laura on. We look forward to doing more of it. And again, we are Family Office Association, so operational, structural, and a lot of the issues that are even non-investment centric are still foundational and very important to me and to my organization, as well as to my members. You can learn more about us at familyofficeassociation.com. I'm also very active on social media. We're a Family Office Association on Instagram, and I have a pretty substantial YouTube platform, at least by Family Office standards. Uh, at Simply Family Office. So I registered that on YouTube probably 12, 13 years ago. So lucky to have a great name there. You'll find it, Family Office or Family Office channel. You'll see my little circle picture uh, and click on it and subscribe. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. On that note, again, Laura, thank you so much for being a guest today. I look forward to seeing you in the future. Well, thank you for having me. It was great. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.